dark, dark world contains strong language and depictions of sex, violence, and sexual violence. Please use discretion when listening to our episodes. April 25th, 2007. Surrey County, Virginia. When he had been arrested five nights earlier, 26-year-old Devon T. Body gave police his cousin's address. Devon was arrested outside of the Royal Suite nightclub for possession of narcotics with intent to distribute. So when Surrey County authorities pulled onto his cousin's 15-acre property at 1915 Moonlight Road in Smithfield, they did so in hopes of uncovering evidence of a narcotics distribution operation. The first officers on the scene pulled up and parked in the main driveway of the house at the front of the property. The driver got out and adjusted his belt as he looked up at the lavish five-bedroom house. When his partner closed the passenger door and walked up beside him, the first officer said, So this is what that NFL money gets you, huh? As the rest of the squad cars and vans arrived, Many of the officers and investigators made similar remarks. They fanned out across the property, lead investigators walking up to the front door, while other units flanked the house and made their way to the rear. Inside the house, investigators discovered a palatial home, brightly lit, loaded with high-end furniture, and featuring a multi-level media theater. But for the investigators working outside of the house, the appearance of the property was much darker. Some 200 yards behind the mansion, officers discovered dozens of dogs chained to car axles that had been buried under the dirt. The axles were buried systematically at equal distance from the next, far enough apart so that the dogs were just out of reach from one another. Some dogs snarled and barked aggressively, while others cried and cowered, submitting to any officer who walked past. Many dogs were scarred, some recently injured. Nearly all appeared to be significantly underfed. Beyond the rows of chained dogs were narrow runs, lined with shoddy caging. Inside each run was another emaciated dog, with just enough room to turn around to gain access through a hole in the caging to drink from a filthy water bowl. What are we looking at here? said one officer. What the fuck is this? Rattled and heavy-hearted, the authorities pressed on, moving farther back on the expansive property. When they came to a decrepit outbuilding, painted all in black, Nearly every officer on the scene felt an ominous sense of dread. Said one investigator, quote, You could feel it. We all did. It just hits you in your gut. You know there's evil around you. End quote. On the ground floor of the two-story outbuilding, authorities discovered a primitive dog training center, complete with treadmills and slap mills, training and breeding equipment, including an apparatus called a mating cradle, which is commonly referred to callously in the breeding industry as a rape rack. An aggressive or otherwise unwilling female dog is placed in the apparatus, strapped down with her head restrained while the male mounts her. Strewn about the room were several poles and snares used to control animals. Some investigators found instruments they were unfamiliar with, but would later discover are called brakes, or parting sticks, used to pry open a dog's mouth. In a makeshift office, several documents were discovered that outlined potential gambling and animal breeding ventures. In cabinets within the offices, scores of prescription medication bottles were discovered along with charts indicating dosages for canines. 
Investigators made their way up a creaky, narrow stairway, also painted black. As they walked off the stairs onto the second level, they looked around the space. The wooden walls and floors were shredded with claw marks. Teeth and paw nails were found stuck in the floorboards. Blood spatter adorned each and every wall. The investigators found themselves standing in a fighting ring. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of Dark Dark World. I'm your host, Jordan Crittenden. Join me as I enter Bad News Kennels. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Just a little bit of housekeeping today before I get back to the episode. We're also out there on other social media platforms, including Instagram and Twitter, at Dark World Pod on Twitter, and at Dark Dark World Podcast on Instagram. You can always drop us an email at darkworldpod at gmail.com. And if you're liking the podcast and would like to learn how to support it, check us out on Patreon at patreon.com slash darkdarkworld. There you can support the show for as little as $2 a month and gain access to exclusive rewards, including bonus episodes, blooper reels, video content. So check that out. We would greatly appreciate it if you would go and leave a review of the show wherever you are listening to this right now. Thanks very much. I think that this is a pretty interesting episode that I've got for you today. I do want to give a little bit of an extra warning that if you have a hard time hearing about violence towards animals, you may not want to proceed with this one. It can be pretty harrowing at parts. But now I will return to our story in Surrey County, Virginia, 2007. The house at 1915 Moonlight Road was owned by Devon T. Body's cousin, NFL quarterback Michael Vick. After the state investigation of Vic's property yielded evidence of an illegal dogfighting operation, the athlete blamed Devon Body and other family members that lived at the property. At a news conference, Michael Vick claimed that he didn't reside at the house and rarely visited the family members who did live there. He denied having any knowledge of a dogfighting ring. Yet less than one week later, Michael Vick listed the Surrey County house and property at 50% of its assessed value. Days later, the house was under a sales contract. While no official sale of the property would occur for several more months, the haste with which Vick seemed determined to be rid of the property raised eyebrows. Animal rights and animal welfare activists condemned Vick publicly but he also had a fair amount of support, primarily from fans of his NFL team, the Atlanta Falcons. Michael Vick was drafted by the Falcons first overall in the 2001 NFL Draft, making him the first African-American quarterback to be selected with a number one pick. He signed a six-year, $62 million contract with the Falcons, and in 2002, he became their starting quarterback. On the field, Vic was dynamic. Fast, with a powerful arm and an unmatched ability to elude defenders, Vic became the first quarterback to rush for 1,000 yards in an NFL season. He led the Falcons to the playoffs multiple times and became the only quarterback to ever beat Brett Favre and the Green Bay Packers at home at Lambeau Field in the playoffs. 
On May 3, 2007, just over a week after the search of Vic's property, the Humane Society of the United States wrote a letter to the National Football League urging the league to conduct an investigation into its players' potential involvement in dogfighting. This came on the heels of some NFL players publicly defending Michael Vick and mocking the idea that dogfighting is a crime. In a radio interview, star running back Clinton Portis said, quote, I don't know if he was fighting dogs or not, but it's his property. It's his dogs. If that's what he wants to do, do it. See, dogfighting is a prevalent part of life. I know a lot of back roads that got a dogfight if you want to go see it. But they're not bothering those people, because those people aren't big names. End quote. Weeks rolled on, and much of the media attention surrounding both dogfighting and Michael Vick began to die down. However, Surrey County Sheriff Harold D. Brown and Virginia Commonwealth's prosecuting attorney Gerald G. Poindexter continued to respond to some remaining media inquiries. The Commonwealth assured that they were proceeding carefully with the investigation, which was still ongoing, and that, quote, anyone, whoever they are, who evidence indicates had acted unlawfully, will be charged, end quote. Poindexter admitted that he did not have any solid evidence to connect Michael Vick to dogfighting on the Surrey County property or anywhere else primarily because no eyewitnesses claimed that they had seen any dogfighting on the property. Poindexter urged patience, explaining that these investigations should not be rushed, and mentioning that he had lost a previous dogfighting case that he was prosecuting due to an illegal search. But by June of 2007, eyewitnesses had come forward. The Surrey County investigation turned up several individuals that the state deemed credible to give testimony regarding dogfighting on the Moonlight Road property. Also in June, a subsequent federal investigation, headed by both the FBI and the U.S. Department of Agriculture, turned up more evidence of dogfighting and of Michael Vick's direct involvement. The USDA had begun several investigations of this type, after Congress had passed a law earlier that year making the organizing of a dogfight a felony. It was this federal investigation that broke the story wide open. One witness came forward to inform federal investigators that several dog carcasses had been buried on the Moonlight Road property. Eventually, this information was enough for the USDA to obtain a search warrant for the property and two federal searches were conducted. The first took place on June 7, 2007, and the second a month later on July 6. During the second search, a news helicopter with the Richmond Times Dispatch observed 15 vehicles on the property, including a rental truck and a Virginia State Police evidence collection truck. Investigators were seen working under a blue tarp on a wooded portion of the property near the black-painted outbuildings. The investigators were sifting dirt and clearing brush. Ultimately, they removed nearly ten complete dog carcasses from two shallow mass graves. On the very same day, July 6, 2007, ESPN Sports Network reported that Michael Vick would likely not be indicted on federal charges as a result of the dogfighting investigation. Authorities were reported to have told the NFL and the Atlanta Falcons that there was no evidence to link Vick to the alleged dogfighting ring and that three other individuals were expected to be indicted instead. However, on July 17, 2007, Purnell Peace, Qantas Phillips, Tony Taylor, and Michael Vick were indicted by a federal grand jury for conspiracy to travel in interstate commerce in aid of unlawful activities and to sponsor a dog in an animal fighting venture. The interstate commerce designation gave the federal court jurisdiction over activities that would otherwise be regulated at the state level. 
and in this case, interstate commerce included the transporting of fighting dogs across state lines and hosting dogfight participants from other states at the property on Moonlight Road. The property that these dogfight participants, as well as the defendants, referred to as Bad News Kennels. In 2001, when Michael Vick began his NFL career, he and three longtime friends and associates, Purnell Peace, Qantas Phillips, and Tony Taylor, began a dogfighting operation they called Bad News Kennels. The name is a play on the name of the men's hometown of Newport News, Virginia, although news is spelled with a Z in Bad News Kennels, I guess for extra cool factor cool with a K. The group set up their operation on 15 acres of Surrey County land purchased by Michael Vick. The following passage comes from a case study by the Animal Legal Defense Fund, or ALDF. Quote, They bought dogs in Virginia and in other states and brought the dogs to their new kennel. The men erected a fence around the property to ensure that the buildings used for the training and fighting would not be seen. They buried dozens of car axles, and to the axles, they affixed heavy chains. This method is dogfighting 101. It allows the dogs to be secured and out of reach from other dogs, while the pivoting axle prevents the chains from tangling. The men tested the dogs in fights, then shot, electrocuted, or hanged dogs who did not perform well. In or about April 2007, Peace, Phillips, and Vic executed approximately eight dogs who did not perform well in testing sessions by various methods, including hanging, drowning, electrocution, and beating. A report by a USDA investigator provided more detail on the April 2007 killings, saying that the men hanged approximately three dogs, quote, by placing a nylon cord over a two by four that was nailed to two trees located next to the big shed. They also drowned three dogs by putting the dogs' heads in a five gallon bucket of water. One time in spring of 2003, peace after consulting with Vic about a losing female's condition, executed the dog by wetting her down with water and electrocuting her. End quote. From Jim Gorin's book, The Lost Dogs, quote, As the little red dog lay on the ground, fighting for air, Qantas Phillips grabbed its front legs and Michael Vic grabbed its back legs. They swung the dog over their heads like a jump rope, then slammed it to the ground. The first impact didn't kill it. So Phillips and Vic slammed it again. The two men kept at it, alternating back and forth, pounding the creature against the ground until at last, the little red dog was dead. End quote. From the ALDF case study again. Quote, According to witnesses, the men fought their trained pit bulls with random stray dogs and even family pet dogs because they thought it was funny to watch the big muscular pit bulls belonging to bad news injure or kill the little dogs. End quote. The co-conspirators hosted fights at the Virginia property and transported dogs to other properties in other states for fights basically a home and away scenario. The fights typically occurred late at night or in the early morning and would last for several hours. Before fights, dogs were bathed to remove any poison or narcotics that might have been placed on them to hinder their opponent's performance. Losing dogs often died in the ring or in the pit, depending on the quality of the setting. Gambling purses for the fights varied but were often placed in the tens of thousands of dollars. One witness testified that Michael Vick once wagered $40,000 on just one fight from one evening 
and it was common for Vic to place bets on every bad news kennel's dog that fought each night. After their federal indictments came down, Peace, Phillips, Taylor, and Vic faced up to $350,000 in fines and up to six years in prison for their charges. But remember, they weren't charged for any of the harrowing stuff that you just heard about. They were simply being charged for the interstate transportation of animals for dogfighting venture. Um, it, It was the business end that the law was coming after them for. The animals seemingly viewed as commodities by the federal government just as much as they were by the defendants. This statement from Michael Vick outside of court from a later date that we'll get to shortly seems to prove that. Quote, Yeah, fine, I killed the dogs. I hung them. I slammed them. I killed all of them. I lost fucking millions. All over some fucking dogs. End quote. Leading up to the arraignments, Nike suspended plans to release a Michael Vick signature shoe and would later terminate their endorsement contract with Vic. PETA staged protests outside of NFL headquarters in New York City, calling for Vic's firing. Senators, journalists, athletes, and influencers of all sorts wrote letters to NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell, calling for Vic to be suspended. More PETA-organized protests, but ones that were better attended than the first, were staged outside of Atlanta Falcons' training camp. However, Michael Vick wasn't there, as Commissioner Roger Goodell had already written a letter to Vick, ordering him not to report to Falcons' camp. An excerpt from that letter. Quote, While it is for the criminal justice system to determine your guilt or innocence, it is my responsibility as Commissioner of the National Football League to determine whether your conduct even if not criminal, nonetheless violated league policies, including the personal conduct policy. End quote. When the arraignment hearings took place on July 26th, Michael Vick, Qantas Phillips, Purnell Peace, and Tony Taylor pleaded not guilty, and a trial was set to begin four months later on November 26th. And later on July 26th, Nike suspended Vic's contract indefinitely and without pay, while Adidas's Reebok division announced it would stop selling Michael Vick jerseys, and the NFLshop.com pulled all Vic-related merchandise. Four days later, Tony Taylor reversed his plea and entered a plea of guilty to the charges of interstate commerce and sponsoring a dog. Then, on August 17th, Purnell Peace and Qantas Phillips pled guilty as well and entered plea agreements in U.S. District Court in Richmond, Virginia. Purnell Peace's summary of the facts read in part, quote, All three participated in executing the dogs. Peace agrees and stipulates that these dogs all died as a result of the collective efforts of Peace, Phillips, and Vic. End quote. The Newport News Daily Press reported that because of the language in Peace's plea agreement, quote, upward departure from the sentencing guidelines is necessary in this case. Judge Hudson told the men that the aggravating factors will be taken into consideration at sentencing, which means they could face harsher punishments, end quote. Finally, on August 24, 2007, Michael Vick signed a plea agreement admitting that he participated in and funded an interstate dogfighting ring. His official statement maintains that he did not place any bets or take any prize money. But I'll remind you again of what he said outside of court after he signed this plea agreement. Quote, Yeah, fine, I killed the dogs. I hung them, I slammed them, I killed all of them. I lost fucking millions all over some fucking dogs. End quote. So do you think a guy like that might have placed some bets, might have cared about the money? 
Purnell Peace and Qantas Phillips were sentenced to 18 and 21 months in federal prison, respectively. Their sentences included three years of supervised probation following their release from prison. Michael Vick was sentenced to 23 months in federal prison, receiving the harshest sentence as a result of being the last to plea and the first to lie about his knowledge of the dogfighting operation. The National Football League suspended Vic indefinitely and without pay. Commissioner Goodell also freed the Atlanta Falcons to assert any claims or remedies to recover $22 million of Vic's signing bonus from the 10-year, $130 million contract that he had signed in 2004. Michael Vick would play in the NFL again after he was released from prison which happened three months shy of his full sentence, due to good behavior. And last, but not least, and certainly most important, the dogs. What happened to all those dogs the investigators discovered chained up on the property? Unfortunately, it's all too common in these types of situations for dogs such as these to simply be euthanized but that's not what happened here. Per the ALDF, quote, The U.S. District Court appointed Rebecca J. Huss, professor of law at Valparaiso University School of Law, as the guardian to advise the court regarding the final disposition of the 48 seized dogs. Per her recommendation, the dogs were eventually dispersed to eight rescue organizations for adoption, rehabilitation, or lifetime care in sanctuaries where they have been neutered. End quote. From Jim Gorin's book, The Lost Dogs, quote, What the ASPCA animal behavior team found was a mixed bag. Fewer than a dozen of the dogs were hardened fighters. Two had to be put down. One was excessively violent, and the other was suffering from an irreparable injury. Then there was a group characterized as pancake dogs, animals so traumatized they flattened themselves on the ground and trembled when humans approached. Another group seemed to be dogs of relatively friendly, normal temperament who had simply never been socialized. End quote. All of the rescued dogs, by the way, were done so at the expense of Michael Vick as part of his plea agreement. The dogs are sometimes referred to as the victory dogs. Victory spelled V-I-C-K-T-O-R-Y. Many of the dogs have gone on to work as therapy dogs and are largely doing very well. As I mentioned, this isn't a typical scenario, so it's really nice to see that this particularly awful story has an ending like this for some of the victims. A New York Times article from February 2nd, 2008, follows up with one of the victory dogs named Georgia. Quite nicely, I think. Here is an excerpt from that article. Quote, A quick survey of Georgia, a caramel-colored pit bull mix with cropped ears and soulful brown eyes, offers a roadmap to a difficult life. Her tongue juts from the left side of her mouth, because her jaw, once broken, healed at an awkward angle. Her tail zigzags. Scars from puncture wounds on her face, legs, and torso reveal that she was a fighter. Her misshapen, dangling teats show that she might have been such a successful, vicious competitor that she was forcibly bred again and again. But there is one haunting sign that Georgia might have endured the most abuse of any of the 48 surviving pit bulls that were seized. Georgia has no teeth. All 42 of them were pried from her mouth, most likely to make certain she could not harm male dogs during forced breeding. Her caregivers here at the Best Friends Animal Society Sanctuary, the new home for 22 of Mr. Vick's former dogs, are less concerned with her physical wounds than her emotional ones. They wonder why she barks incessantly at her doghouse, 
and what makes her roll her toys so obsessively that her nose is rubbed raw. Having those teeth extracted, Dr. McMillan and other vets said, must have been excruciating. Even with medication, dogs are in pain after losing one tooth, which may take more than an hour of digging, prying, and leveling to pull. But now she is safe and happy. Georgia is known to lick the face of anyone who comes near. End quote. According to the ASPCA, the Bad News Kennels case sparked several legislative successes for animal welfare and animal rights. After the case, a wave of state laws passed to crack down on dogfighting. In 2008, Idaho and Wyoming became the 49th and 50th states to make dogfighting a felony. Over the past 10 years, state legislators have given law enforcement more tools including criminalizing the possession of dogfighting implements, increasing penalties for spectators, and adding dogfighting as a RICO offense. Also inspired by the bad news case, Congress included language in the 2008 Farm Bill that strengthened the federal law against dogfighting and made it illegal to use the U.S. Postal Service to promote animal fighting. This bill also raised the maximum federal penalty for participating in an animal fighting venture. In 2013, the Animal Fighting Spectator Prohibition Act was introduced, making it a federal offense to knowingly attend an organized animal fight and imposing penalties for taking children to animal fights. And there is now much more dialogue around one of the biggest challenges to dogfighting investigations, covering the enormous expenses associated with caring for victimized animals. These costs include emergency sheltering, veterinary care, behavioral assessment, and rehabilitation from trauma. This cost of care issue is as much about saving lives as it is about saving money, because a high price tag can make state agencies think twice before intervening in a cruelty situation. The ASPCA and its partners have been pushing for cost of care remedies at both the state and federal level. And this from the ASPCA directly. Quote, These are important advances, but make no mistake, dogfights continue to take place and animals continue to suffer violently as a result. By our estimate, there are still tens of thousands of dogfighters in the U.S., forcing hundreds of thousands of dogs to brutally train, fight, and suffer every year. The ASPCA will continue to mark National Dogfighting Awareness Day every April 8th until dogfighting is so shunned and its participants so shamed and appropriately sentenced that the brutal activity is not only deterred, but completely eradicated. And you can play a part in that outcome. Even if you don't know any dogfights or fighters, there's still a lot you can do. Speak out against dogfighting using the hashtag GetTough. Visit ASPCA.org slash get tough dash campaign and share the information with friends, family, and colleagues. And this one's very important. Help end the life-threatening stereotyping of particular breeds, often pit bulls, by fighting breed-specific regulations and prohibitions, and by fostering formerly abused animals where and when you can. And I will leave some of the links to these campaigns in the show notes, and on social media. And that, ladies and gentlemen, will conclude the narrative portion of today's episode. And now, get ready, Ed Heads, because Ed C. is coming on to break down what you just heard. We're going into the dark, dark room to have a little discussion about Bad News Kennels. Evil all around us, Jordy. Welcome to Dark Dark Room. Thank you. That was a terrible story. Yeah. Well told, but... Thank you. Terrible. So much worse than I thought it was going to be when I sat down to start researching. Yeah. Um, It was... uh, We just listened to it together, and uh, boy, boy, was that disgusting. 
Well, let's do our shout out here to Paul and Adelaide for uh, suggesting that I talk about a case with Jordan after he does the narrative episode. Paul, I'm mad at you. I'm very, <laughs> I'm very sad now. But thank you for the suggestion. Jordi and I will now start talking about this uh, horrendous crime era. Yeah. Yeah, so we're, we're, we're following Paul's request to do some Killer Santa style. Thanks, Paul. Yeah. <laughs> and here we are. So um, let's break this down. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, what was it like doing this? I actually got teary a couple times. Yeah. I usually don't. And mm -hmm. there have been some really intense details that we've done before, like uh, both in abductions, that got you emotional. Mm -hmm. uh, when I did the Toolbox Killers very early on, first one, uh, that one was really tough. But, but we, had, we had talked, uh, I guess in the Q&A, that was the last time we, we spoke, that you felt... Like oh no, do I have no soul? I don't get uh, emotionally affected when I when I do the narrative stories. But this one, gotcha. This one did, and I guess it's as simple as dogs are so much sweeter than humans, kind of thing. And so it's easier for me to feel empathy for sweet little dogs than it is for you know humans. It's easier for me to. I don't know. I guess dogs are just so sweet and innocent, uh -huh. and you know. They didn't do. Humans they are didn't so do anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> not that any of the victims that are human deserve what happens to them either. But it's you know. It's, I understand what you're you saying. When you see the horse die in the movie, it's sadder than the guys dying in war. You know. Sure, I I understand. So teary eyed, uh, but but good researching. I so I of course, uh, but had heard of this, but. Didn't didn't really know any any specifics about it. Way nastier than I had thought. Yeah, and, I, and same for me. I had I my impression was just that he was involved in a couple dog fights. Not that there were mm. scores of dogs on his property, and they were murdering dogs in all sorts of creative ways. And uh, ugh. Yeah, no, I, I mean, we read just listened to this. I'm still still a bit in in shock from hearing this story, but uh, maybe maybe you started off, Jordan, because I'm I'm still digesting. Yeah, well, it, for me, I remember when the story broke. I wasn't really into football at that time, so I had a cursory awareness that it was happening, but no details. And then later, as I sort of did get into NFL and stuff, uh, I became more aware of it, read a little bit about it, and knew, I did know that it was a whole operation, that he had a, a, a kennel, and it was a dog fighting operation, but I had no idea of the extent, like you said, the, the creative ways of torturing and killing these animals, and just how little regard they had for the animals. I mean, you don't have much regard for an animal if you're fighting it anyway, but I never thought it was this bad. And I actually, I always sort of thought, well, yeah, Michael Vick got in this trouble. I remember he had this dog fighting trouble, but I know he's sort of become a stand-up guy and paid his his debt to society. And mm -hmm. he's actually now done a lot of good for dogs because he's got all these dog charities. And, you know, maybe he's done some of the worst things you could do to a dog, but he's also done a lot more good for dogs than most of us have. Uh, but no. When I dug up that quote... Uh, the, do you want me to read the quote? Yeah, sure. We'll have it again. All right. Let's see. Yeah, fine. I killed the dogs. I hung them. I slammed them. I killed them. I lost fucking millions all over some fucking dogs. Yeah. I understand that was right after he's getting sentenced and, you know, he's he's fired up, but... I think that's pretty telling about how he felt about these animals. Well, I mean, also a point could be made that his uh, uh, his fame and who he was in this happening is actually a net positive in that, as you mentioned at the end of the episode, the how it has actually changed laws that different 
uh, agencies are now getting better funding for for this sort of thing, and that there are campaign, you know, and whatever that jerk uh, who was it? Um, stand by, I have this in my notes. Yeah. Clinton Portis, mm. fuck you. <laughs> uh, but like to to Clinton Portis's point, there's there's dark fights happening all over the place. It's just because he's famous. Well, the, I, I guess the point I'm making is, I don't think his dog karma can ever get to a net zero or positive. But uh, on account of his his level of fame and the the changes that have come be, because of it, that's all right. Yeah, well, just even the fact that they were able to save all of these dogs because mm-hmm. he had so much money, and they yes. said, "Well, since you can afford to take care of NFL this, we'll do money, it. Yeah. otherwise they probably would have been euthanized." Yeah, uh, that's usually what happens, sadly. Um. All right. Well, but so, on the on the Clinton Portis thing, what, do you want to read his quote, or did you not write it down? I just wrote down Clinton Portis. Fuck you. Right. Uh, his point was that look, dog dog fighting is a prevalent part of our lives down here you don't know the way we grew up and there are dog fights on any back road in my hometown and i can show you one and this is part of the culture and i i wanted to this i didn't include in the episode but during sentencing uh one of the attorneys for Qantas phillips argued that his client came from a culture in which dog fighting was an accepted practice he further claimed that phillips grew up around it and that it was a proving ground for young men to demonstrate their strength, adding, quote, dogfighting was an accepted and acceptable activity in their world, end quote. They attended dogfights as youths. Then, after Vic signed his first NFL contract, quote, suddenly there's money for these young men to get dogs and get involved in this world, end quote. And that speaks to this idea that I have that a lot of uh, these men certainly see the dogs as just extensions of themselves. To prove their strength yeah, through just, watching a dog fight. Right, even saying that, that it's a proving ground for young men. Mm-hmm. No, you're just holding this dog and then letting it go. Uh, it's completely bizarre. I guess maybe you could say you bred them to be these great fighters. That's how you're showing your strength as a breeder, as a dog abuser. You're really strong at that. Uh, but... They don't see these dogs or animals probably in general as having their own identities, their own feelings. And I think it speaks to a larger problem about dog ownership and dog care in general that there are often men who don't want to neuter their dogs because they feel it will emasculate them to have a dog that's had its testicles removed that somehow speaks to the masculinity of the owner. As a neutered man yourself, do you find uh, do you find that you're emasculated constantly? No. No, <laughs> I never did when I had my dogs neutered, and I don't feel emasculated at this point either. But, and so this is this point that I, this might be slippery slope territory, but it speaks to general ignorance about... I got your safety rope. <laughs> animal welfare in general. People growing up, in neighborhoods where dog fighting is acceptable or probably growing up in neighborhoods that aren't neutering very often. You do have a lot of strays. It leads to overbreeding. And this is why shelters are full of dogs that they end up having no other option but to euthanize. Most of them, or a lot of them, being pit bulls. Um, why, why pit bulls? Well, because they're fighting dogs. Well, be- they're not fighting dogs. They're dogs that are often used or bred to be fighting dogs. And then maybe a lot of the guys fighting dogs don't take it to the extremes that the bad news guys did and hang them or electrocute them afterwards. Maybe that's a bridge too far. And so they just drop them off. They release them if they're loser dogs that aren't going to fight well. They turn them in. Um. Or because they don't neuter... Yeah, no, they're either, yeah, other there's dogs, just a bunch of creating more yeah, strays, pit bulls all over overbreeding. The uh, have you ever known a non-fighting uh, pit bull that had to be euthanized because it attacked people? I haven't personally. No, I haven't. It's very sad. It is sad because, uh, and I mentioned in the episode that ASPCA thing about breed awareness and 
you know, the stereotypes that are out there about pit bulls. Did you know, I, I didn't know until I was researching this, that the whole lockjaw thing is a complete myth. What's lockjaw? That pit bulls will bite and latch on and you can't get them to open their mouths unless you use a prying bar or hold a candle under their uh, I'd never, chin. I never heard that. Yeah, it's like one of the big myths or, or one of the big points against pit bulls. Like, oh, they got that lockjaw, real dangerous, you know. They're, they're aggressive, and then when they latch on, they're going to maul your kid, and they won't let go. Not true. Well, th- I, this is this is side point city, but uh, n- my neighbor, when I lived in New York, had uh, he rescued pit bulls, and one of them was, I forget the terminology. I know that I'm a pancake dog, the person version, but was it was it th- this dog was still viol- and attacked two children and had to be put down I, I'm thinking by law or my neighbor just thought or just I don't want this the, to happen yeah, again the, yeah. I, I had to put down a dog not a pit bull for attacking Declan um, mm. one that we had gotten from a shelter it was a small terrier but it kept happening and it was dangerous and then it also had some medical problems and when they were all factored together the recommendation for us was to probably just put it down because you never know if it's going to be it's worse gonna next again, time. Right? So that was real hard because it was a sweet dog. And that that's the thing with the pit bulls too. By all accounts, if you're not raising them to be fighters and you know beating them up and toughening them mm. in horrible ways, they're extremely loyal and loving dogs just like most dogs are. My favorite dog that it was not a part of my family, a pit bull named Tank. Knew, knew not his own strength. Uh, this was when I was in high school. I was... Uh, Six to eighty pounds, maybe, uh, just just a waif. And this this pit bull outweighed me about forty pounds. And every time I'd go to my friend's house, he would jump up and put his paws on my shoulder and like knock me into the door. And it, he had a clown eye, just the the sweetest man I ever met. Yeah, Tank. I believe it. And it, make no mistake as well, you can breed any kind of dog to be a fighter if you want using the same methods. I mean, you could fight terriers or you or you know, small terriers. Obviously, a pit bull is a terrier also, but welterweights. You could fight. Yeah. I mm-hmm. mean, people are fighting cocks out there. Mhm. You could do it with chihuahuas. There are chihuahua fights. You can do it with people. You can. Um so and it's just such a depraved universe the dog fighting like the Putting narcotics on yeah, the so body this is to like one of my questions. disable what, the other dog is so involved. I don't know if we want to give tips if people are planning on doing dog fight after after hearing this. But what is this rule uh, that there are rules in the dog fighting is insane. But people would put poison or nar- narcotics on their own dogs to mess with the opponent. How does yeah, that work? What's so that, that strategy? Let's say if you put some sort of um poison or uh, some sort of narcotic that would make a dog lethargic maybe on the coat of the dog. It's really not going to hurt the dog that it's on, but with the mouth of the other dog getting all over it, it might ingest that and then be affected. I mean, it's insane. They were giving them PEDs too, like those, the drugs that they found in the offices, uh, you know, the dosages, they were all like performance enhancing things. And it's just, so why did they find so many underfed and sickly dogs as well? I guess just because they They didn't, hadn't got around to murdering them yet? Yeah, maybe they uh, were overbreeding, hadn't turned these ones into seasoned fighters. I'm sure even the ones that were winners didn't get treated very well either and were probably underfed and they had their probably prize. I don't know how many, but ones that they used all the time or you know, if they win, they keep going and then once they lose, they're not used anymore. I'm not sure the ins and outs, but yeah, uh, there are no rules uh, except for, you know, let's make sure we wash them down beforehand, to, you know. And ensure we, don't, that we these... don't talk about Dog Fight Club. Second rule, we don't talk about Dog Fight Club. I remember learning about some cockfighting stuff once that they'll attach like screws or nails, embed them into the talons or the the back heel whatever you call that of the what is a bird's foot called not don't, a beak don't ask me well the foot of a, just, the don't rooster don't talk about it. i'm taking headphones up attach yeah. it's like an implanted nut that they then screw in a long 
nail or screw that they can then slash with. It's insane. Like little Yuri Seinfeld? <laughs> yeah, he could get slashed with a nail. I don't want that. I'm already scared enough of birds. No, just a cyborg bird. Sick world out there. It is a dark, dark world. Um, where it's sort of. I, I don't think I could even watch a dog fight. I I saw some stuff on YouTube. I know once. for a fact I cannot. Yeah, let alone. I, I, I don't know. I can't get myself to a place where I could even imagine holding a dog's head in a five-gallon bucket of water or. Going, okay, if I wet her down and then shock her. I don't know what they used for the electricity. I'm hoping it was a taser and not some like wild wire or something, live wire. Uh, But uh, it's just, and you know, you have to go out of your way to set up that hanging apparatus that they made. Wait, the rape hanging or the the, murder hanging? Plywood they had attached to the two trees with nylon. Like, you know, just. Put the dog out of its misery. If you must kill it, let's not come up with creative tortury ways to do it. Yeah, so that's slamming in, yeah, the dog. At least in in this inhumane is the most inhumane of worlds. Let's at least shoot the dogs. Have it have it quick. Let's not be slamming dogs. Um, can we talk briefly about how weird this case itself is legally? Sure. So they were convicted of interstate commerce whatever right. in the they, u.s they fled to that yeah. the usda was the department in charge yeah with the fbi with the, yeah, the usda was the one that was able to obtain the warrant because of the buried carcasses which that is I so think wild. i couldn't find out why that the fbi couldn't get a warrant for that but the usda could and i think it has to do with the agricultural aspect of remains buried somewhere on a property like that like in rural area has to do with quality of land what insane laws we have yeah that you have to get the department of agriculture to 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 get a conviction if they hadn't that year on that farm bill changed the law so that that um making dog fighting the organizing of a dog fight actually scheduling one a felony. And if they hadn't done that, the USDA wouldn't be doing these investigations. So they would probably would have gotten away with it because no one else was able to get the warrant to go and dig up carcasses or look for carcasses. And he probably would have completed the sale of the house. I don't know. I couldn't find out what that was. There is a weird video on YouTube of sort of a realtor advertising the property and it starts off sort of nice and then just gets really bizarre and the fact that they didn't just remove the whole dog fighting part of it before selling the house seems odd to me and this was after vic went to prison this isn't vic selling the property i think it was taken by the state and then auctioned off but listen to how weird this is property formerly owned by michael vic in surrey county virginia will be sold again this time at an auction The main home features five bedrooms, a two-car garage, a media room, formal living and dining rooms, and a family room with a fireplace. The two-story white brick home sits on 15 acres of land. The area behind the house, once the home of Bad News Kennels, is mostly still intact. Inside and out building and up the stairs was once the ring where most of the dog fights occurred. It was originally a drug investigation of a Vic relative in April, which led to the discovery of more than 50 pit bulls and equipment commonly used in dogfighting on the property on Moonlight Road. The auction of the house and property will be at 12 noon on December 15th. Wonderful selling points. A yeah. lot of that stuff's still intact. Still teeth and nails in the floor in that outhouse. So gross. Or back house. And rather. what's sick is it probably is a selling point for some per- rich person who thinks Michael Vick's cool or something. Like, dude, I got the fucking whole dog fighting ring and everything's still intact. The whole it's, situation. No, it's not like, I wouldn't be surprised. Look like at the some Sharon of these people. Tate house. Ugh. Well, may, uh, if you were a Vic, what I bet Clinton Portis would be interested. If you were a Vic fan and you didn't think there was anything wrong with dog fighting, it's sort of a, it's like more memorabilia, you, I, controversial I, memorabilia. Yeah, like more if you're a get, dog fighting fan. Did you know, like, Lawrence Bittaker makes greeting cards from prison and sends them out and signs them pliers, 
the nickname they gave him because he used mm-hmm. the pliers on the girls. I did not know that. Like people buy them. Like people want this stuff. It's people are fans sick. of true crime. They really are. Um, okay. So just a couple more questions about the actual the the case and the prosecution. Mm. Tony Taylor. Yes. He's the first one to to do a plea deal. First one to do a plea deal and also apparently not involved with any dog killing. So I guess he's the best of the bunch. Yes. And so I'm assuming that he just sort of ratted out the whole scheme and then that's why everyone else pled within three or four days. Like the other two were three days later and then Vic four days later, something like yeah, that. Yeah, I do wonder if Vic would have pled before even if tony went first and then vic went before the other two if it would have been better for him or not or if he was always going to be the i I, yeah i mean he is i i would doubt he's the mastermind he's probably the busiest of the four with his uh quarterbacking he's a quarterback he's a quarterback yeah Yeah. the throwing and the handing off and the thousand yards running. running yeah he's a good runner um so yeah i think he'd be the 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 master villain regardless but also it does mention which you know stands to reason makes sense he was the first to lie and say that he knew nothing about it and the last to plead so yeah that, that's taken into consideration and so i'm also why did they admit to the like the murders and stuff because they weren't charged with that that's a very good question i don't know apparently a lot uh, I did mention in there the state investigation. There are two separate investigations, and the state one never ends up having as many charges or a larger sentence. So they just kind it's of defer they put a to the federal in one. Charge. Yeah, but Poindexter did have several witnesses that came forward, and I guess the Newport newspaper, Newport News newspaper, had mentioned that sentencing would be harsher given some of the facts that had come to light, even though they weren't being charged with those things, it would be weighed in with sentencing. So maybe they thought if they just pled to everything that was alleged, they would go easier on them. And they actually did go slightly easier on them than they did with Vic. Vic's total sentence was what? 23 months. 23 months. And he did 20. um, And then, so what has he done? He's just an advocate for, for dogs now. Uh, I don't know what he's currently doing. He's now just like an NFL pundit. He's retired and everything. He's a talker on TV. But uh, who, in addition to taking care of the dogs... Did he come the back big, to the NFL after the... Yeah, he, he oh, okay. Yeah, different team. He he went to a different bird team, the Eagles, instead of the Falcons. And it was controversial. A lot of people wanted him not to come back. Uh, he came back and was great Was well for a little while and then got old and... Retired. Didn't, uh, didn't get put to sleep, didn't get electrocuted, or his no, head held in, no, in a bucket of water. No, came out of prison very apologetic, uh, wanted to so you know, pre- play in the NFL again. And prison he did like a for him. 60 Minutes interview where he sounds, I don't know, he doesn't sound genuinely remorseful, but he's saying all the right things. And um, He does have a couple of dog charities can't remember the names of them. One might be Victory Dogs or something. Uh, but yeah, so he's done a lot now for dogs. That's sort of the irony when I was saying he's also done more for dogs than probably right. most of us ever will, mm-hmm. but circumstantial. Uh, uh, yes, exactly. And the fact that he did the dog fighting, raising the awareness more. Uh, yeah. More, more irony. Well, I feel like we should, we should celebrate April 8th every day. Yeah. The day where we shame people involved in the world of dog fighting. April 8th is a beautiful day. Happy April 8th every day. And, uh, what's a slap mill? A slat mill. Slat yeah. mill. What's it's a, well, it's what's just a, an angled uh, picture, like a little wooden. It might. It has little metal rolling pins between oh, okay. diagonal slats of wood. I understand. And so if they run up it. It's a treadmill. It rolls. It's like a treadmill, yeah. But they also have real treadmills that are made for dogs, which are adorable. I've seen a dog on a treadmill. Yeah, Very on a real good. treadmill or on a dog treadmill? Uh, on a person treadmill. Yeah. Someone had to press the buttons, but yeah. the dog was really good at it. <laughs> I also, uh, oh, that mating cradle thing is disgusting. The the rape saddle. Yeah, the rape rack. Yeah. Uh, well, talk about it. It's just this sort of medieval looking 
thing where they it keeps the female from being able to defend herself. You know, out in the wild, dogs still have to work for it. The female doesn't just let it happen necessarily. She'll fight them off a little bit, and if you're, you know, deserving, then you can breed. Yeah, but a, a lady like Georgia, she's going to bite you. She's yeah. going to beat the shit out That's of you right. if you try to rape her. You're going to pull all her poor little teeth. Yeah. Um, so I guess maybe she was t- intense even in the, the rape rack. It's ha- for her. It sounds it. She's a hero. And I found some weird pictures online of like breeders, just non-fighting breeders, just regular breeders, like a French bulldog breeder using one where the man, the human man, was holding the female dog, even though she's already in the cradle, I guess to like comfort her while this mount, this unwanted mounting is happening. It was the most bizarre picture. You were looking at pornography. <laughs> it was. Um, oh, okay. And then who are these maniacs allowing their pets in the dog fights? You mentioned I, that. Yeah, and I don't think it was anyone allowing their pets. I believe they were stolen pets, like stolen from yards. And uh, then just thrown or in. Or strays get root- that were running around as so well. So this is, in addition to the competition, like my dog is better than your dog. They also, it seems like they just enjoyed dog murder. Yeah, that's the thing that... If you're going to be electrocuting and drowning, there's a sick pleasure that must come from that other than just making it as quick as possible. Plus, they probably all the drugs they had, they probably could have just injected them if they wanted. But it's about hurting them and like enjoying it. The, the laughing and thinking it's funny seeing little pet dogs get killed in the ring. It's just, I don't have that in me. Well, you're, you're, also, a pan, you're also a pancake. And yeah, I think... I think that's all my notes. It was a really sad story, but also it it does have that nice silver lining at the end that most of the dogs, uh, almost all of the dogs that were still alive, stayed alive and are now living much, much better lives, which is great. And, uh, you know, as far as a, a lot of the cases that we talk about, I don't know that there's ever been a better victim outcome here because of all the legislation that happened because of this one. And the actual victims, most of the remaining victims being okay in the end and being taken care of. Uh, so it's kind of nice for a change. Uh, for, the, for the future, how, how do they plan on finding these dog fighting rings? Do you know? Did you, did you find any, anything about that? No. I think it's probably just reporting people report them or... You know, they hear rumors of certain certain things, or maybe they do stumble upon it looking for something else, like in this case. Well, yes, if you hear if you hear something or you see something, say something. Yeah, report that stuff. Um, and don't go. If you're reporting because you were there. That's a federal crime. Rethink that. Don't bring any kids either. Well, don't, don't go. Right. You're not a snitch. Uh, if you but re- it is weird that they make harsher penalties for bringing a kid there when it's already like, well, no, it's a crime to even go, and also it's a crime to bring a kid. Well, yes, if it's a crime to be there, it's also a crime to have a kid there with you. Yeah, I, but if I, the kid goes himself, is it a crime, or is it just bringing a kid? I don't, I don't know. That's a very we need we need legal expert. And oh it's no, too late. attending is a crime. So the kid would get prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law if he went by himself. But yeah, but as parent, a juvenile. So, kids, if you're thinking of going to a dog fight, make sure a parent takes you so they can take the fall. Um, why don't you throw out the, um, the charities again, if you have them on hand? Because these are, these are functional, actionable charities yeah. for a just cause. I will put these in the show notes as well. We'll throw them up in the Facebook group. You can speak out on social media, including Facebook, using the hashtag get tough. And that's not like a cute tough, like T-U-F-F, like rough. It's get tough, T-O-U-G-H. Visit ASPCA.org slash get tough dash campaign. That will give you more information to share with friends, family, and colleagues. And please, as we mentioned a couple of times, Help end the life-threatening stereotyping of particular breeds, often pit bulls, by fighting breed-specific regulations and prohibitions. And I can share a link for more information on how to do that. Well, I liked um, 
you know, hashing it out with you after. Yeah, I'm glad that we got to speak. I'm glad that you're uh, human after all and, and that a, a tear was shed. Yeah, a couple of them. I actually, maybe I'll be able to put this in the bloopers or something, you know, when I put audio of mistakes I made. There are a couple of quivers uh, reading some of the quotes of the horrendous acts they did. I might be able to capture some of that. I guess they're not really bloopers. It's kind of sad, but it might be kind of fun. Yeah. I'll give my public service announcements. Please neuter your animals, dogs in particular, and okay. don't go to dog fights, <laughs> please. Uh, yeah, and don't don't support dog fighters. Don't discriminate against pit bulls. They're just as dear and loving as any dog. Uh, all right. Well, thank you for listening, everybody. Love you. Treat your dogs nice. Yeah, and we probably won't. Um, do this too often, but every once in a while when we have an episode where it works out this way, I think it was a nice suggestion from Paul, and uh, we'll keep doing it. Absolutely. Bye! Bye, guys! <laughs> <laughs>